I'm so split on episode 6 of Masters of the Air. On the one hand, it has some of the best scenes of this entire series. Real tension, real stakes. I couldn't tear myself away from the screen, it was that good. Then suddenly we're ripped away to some of the most boring scenes of the series so far featuring Crosby and Rosenthal enjoying a little bit of rest and relaxation. If this episode had focused purely on the airmen behind enemy lines, this would have easily been a 10 out of 10 episode. However, we spend two thirds of the episode watching people play croquet, listen to music, swim, ride horses and drink whiskey. The actual mental state of these men is barely touched on. And when it is, it's done so in such a fleeting manner that if you blink, you'll miss it. Rosenthal can't get a good night's sleep and just wants to get back in the air. It seems like he wants to get to 25 missions as soon as possible and isn't thinking about his own health and that of his crew. Is he hiding something? Crosby has survivor's guilt due to him taking the place of Bubbles and being the one to come up with the flight plan that led to a disastrous mission where only one plane came back. He's also getting a little flirty with some pommy lass. We get to see how the war is affecting the lives of regular German citizens, but this show makes anyone who isn't an American a complete monster. Unless you're a woman or a child, then you're okay. Bucky's scene see him attempting to get back to England after being shot down, and things don't go very well for him this episode. He really goes through a lot, and while I think it would have been more emotional had it have been a more likeable character, I did come to find myself identifying with him a lot more than I would have previously thought possible. His scenes are definitely the most engaging and are a massive high point of the entire 6th episode. I'm dropping the score of Masters of the Air Episode 6 down to a 7 out of 10. I'm really enjoying the behind enemy lines part with Bucky. I would have preferred to maybe see this aspect of the war with a serviceman that I had a deeper bond with, but I'll take what I can get. It feels kind of cheap that we get basically no follow up to Quinn and Bailey on the train trying to get past the German guards. Just as their journey reached its climax, we are torn away from it. I said I wanted to explore the thoughts and relationships of the crewmen, but this isn't what I was hoping for. They're isolated and talking about their feelings to random characters that are never going to show up again. Rosenthal is talking to a doctor and Crosby is talking to some woman that he was randomly assigned to share a room with. We're always going to end up with one-sided conversations where they try and save face. Two thirds of the episode are spent concentrated on two separate guys lounging around and talking about their feelings to random strangers seems even more boring when contrasted with the exciting, tension-filled scenes of Bucky fighting for survival in occupied Europe. It's a weird design choice and one that I think does not pay off. We're at the two thirds mark of the series and I hope we get way more of the behind enemy lines action rather than the poorly executed, snails paced, supposedly emotional scenes back in old Blighty. We still have the introduction of the Black Airmen to come, so I'm going to assume that's at least one whole episode at least to do them justice. I'm worried that we'll end up with a disjointed mess that ends up not really giving us any memorable moments. And now, onto the spoilers. As per last episode's closing scene, Bucky is now down behind enemy lines, armed with only a pistol and a knife. I'm not even sure how many rounds they were given. Was it just what was in the magazine, or did they carry additional ammunition? I'm assuming they're trying to make their way to Switzerland as a neutral nation to sit out the war. He's scavenging food and comes across a group of children who rat him out. The adults grab their guns and set off after him through the waterways. He almost would have escaped, but he decided to make the fateful mistake of moving backward right into the sights of one of the armed men. Now he's been got. Crosby has been sent to Oxford to attend a conference and for some R&R. I'm glad they went to the trouble of having Crosby learn the correct pronunciation of subaltern. I'm sure it'll come into play at a later date. It's surely not to make the pommy fella look like a pedant. Imagine going halfway around the world, fighting in a war, seeing your friends die in agony, and this is what you remember when you get home. The narration on the train lets us know that part of the reason Crosby is attending the conference is that he took news of Bubbles' death badly. Then his wife also says to say hi to Bubbles in a letter. They're really laying it on thick. I'm assuming his wife doesn't know that Bubbles is MIA because it would be a breach of security to tell her that he was missing or dead. Rosenthal is at Flack House for his R&R &R and he wants out. It was here that I learned that Jews from Brooklyn don't ride horses. Bucky's being transported via train as a captive of the German army and they are forced to work on clearing rubble after the RAF bombed civilians. Those rascally Brits, always making things hard for everyone else. Things quickly go pear-shaped as the population turns on them and start attacking them. The guards even join in, shooting unarmed prisoners of war in the streets. Reminiscent of the German POWs being murdered in Band of Brothers, 
I guess the producers learned their lessons after that, and now it's only the bad guys that commit such atrocities. What are the odds that the German guard doing 360 no-scope headshots would run out of ammo and dry fire multiple times at Buckley? Luckily it was only a four-shot Luger. He must have expended the other half of his magazine earlier on looters during the bombing. Cut to Rosenthal talking to the doctor. You can leave in five days. Anyway, back to Bucky. Bucky's on the back of a wagon that is being driven into a pine forest. The wagon stops and one of the Germans tells the other that he's going to look for a place to bury these bodies. What an odd thing to say. Of course you were, that's why you're both out there. Thankfully, one of the other guys is reciting the Lord's Prayer, so they clobber him with a shovel. Bucky took three hits to the noggin and lived, but this guy is finished off with a single hit. While the two Germans are digging a mass grave, Bucky does a runner. He's spotted, but they couldn't care less and let him go. Getting a lot of coincidences here. And you know how I hate multiple coincidences. Well, anyway, Bucky's out of here. Good makeup job here, I must say. Crosby's at some lecture about the Magna Carta, and of course the speaker gives the Yanks a spray about how it took them 500 years to make something of equal value. Not sure if he's talking about the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. Must be the Constitution, as Crosby says they had to get out from under English rule first. This scene is messed up because the Magna Carta was written under English royal rule. And if this guy was such an Anglophile, I doubt he would have said that anything America produced was even close to the Magna Carta. That's clearly Yankee headcanon. Trust me bro, it totally happened. Weird scene up next with Crosby doing his best Travis Bickle impression. And he gets shacked up with a woman. How uncouth. Supposedly the women are told to use their initials. This will become important later on I'm sure. This is such a letdown after watching a man fight for his life to be watching a man doing impressions in front of a mirror. Rosenthal can't sleep. At least, that's what I assume the five seconds of footage of him sitting in the dark is supposed to represent. Then he goes for a nice walk through the gardens and comes across a poor guy crying his eyes out. I thought he was going to comfort the poor fella, but he just turns around and walks away. I guess we'll never know what he was crying about. We quickly zip away for 30 seconds of Bucky getting captured by a different group of Germans and actually taken to a POW camp. He's got a pretty nice shiner going on too. Straight back into the action as Crosby and his new female roommate show up the stuffy Brits again by telling them that because these men are about to die their behaviour is perfectly acceptable. Could they make these Brits seem more like dogs if they tried? I'm waiting for the black pilots to get involved and to have the Americans defend them from the racist attacks of the Englishmen. So Subalton Westgate went to Cambridge. They don't give degrees to women, you know. Fun fact, they were the last university to do so. Rosenthal can't sleep again. He tells the doctor, who also can't sleep, that he can't sit idly by while people were being persecuted. He should be up there getting the job done to help those people. For a minute there I thought he was alluding to the segregation in the USA, but then I remembered he's Jewish, so he's probably talking about the Holocaust. He likens his role to the drummer in a band. You have to let them keep the rhythm, but the doctor informs him that the drummer also has to keep an eye on the rhythm of the rest of the band. Oh dear god, it's more Crosby action. He's sharing a bottle of whiskey with the subaltern, and it turns out she's Scottish. I never would have guessed it. Somehow the conversation comes around to Bubbles. Dear old Bubbles, we hardly knew ya. Crosby's beating himself up for the failure of the mission. Luckily, Subaltern Westgate is there to let him know that it's all Adolf Hitler's fault. I'm looking at the uncaught bottle of pre-war scotch sitting on the carpet and cringing. Now we're getting to the meat and potatoes of this episode. Bucky is brought before a German interrogator. He's just the right mix of friendly and creepy. Good casting. He's after info, but Bucky's just going to give him his name, rank and serial number. He tries to tempt him with news of the baseball results, the fate of Buck Clevin, and then tries to goad him into giving information in return for not having him executed as a spy. I'm not sure how this works, but they seem to be working under the assumption that Bucky wasn't a member of the crew. Now, wasn't he there as a member of the crew, so he's afforded all the rights of the Geneva Convention? But Bucky's a tough nut to crack and he gives them duck eggs. Sadly, we break from the interrogation of a prisoner of war and return to the flak house where Rosenthal is being offered a coffee and a blanket. What a wholly unnecessary scene. Did we need to know that he woke up? Did we need to know that he's kind of flirty with that bird? Are they just padding the runtime? Now Rosenthal is outside watching some fellas in boats have a water fight. Is this meant to juxtapose the easy living of Rosenthal versus the brutality of captivity as a POW? Because now we're slammed back to Bucky being roused from his sleep by the German guards. 
They're being loaded onto a train. Just at that moment, a Nazi train full of women and children, presumably Jewish, emerges from the mists. It's a pretty brutal sight seeing them all clamming for air as they're packed into their train car like cattle. One of the Yanks decides to make a run for it and he's mown down and thrown into the carriage with Bucky. Filth. Enough of that interesting stuff. Let's go watch Crosby take Subalton Westgate to a party and have a little bit of live music. Just as they come back home and he's about to throw the leg over, a porter comes and hands a note to Westgate. She has to leave, and that's the last we'll ever see of her. She says for Crosby to call her if he's in London again, but that's the last we'll ever see of her. Rosenthal's trying to win everyone's money in a game of poker, but they start telling the story of how he started humming in the last mission. Someone else starts another story and we get a nice little cut on action of the story being continued back at Abbott's Field Bar and Rosenthal and Crosby are back on base. Rosenthal is getting back in his plane and it's called Rosie's Riveters. Nice. He hesitates at the manhole and starts thrumming a beat, just like the drummer from before. When the others join in, he knows they've got the right rhythm. Egan finally makes it to Stalag Luft 3 and is greeted by some familiar faces. I mean to say by a familiar face. It's Andy Dick. I mean Crank. But Bucky wants to know where Buck is and he's just to his right. So everything's going to be all right. Tune in next week for the gritty new season of Hogan's Heroes. This sixth episode of Masters of the Air had some of the best scenes of the entire season. It also had some of the worst. Thankfully, the good outweighs the bad at a ratio of about 7 to 3, so I'm giving episode 6 of Masters of the Air a 7 out of 10. The evasion and eventual capture of Bucky Egan, his transportation, his interrogation was all thrilling and fascinating. It was good to see a slice of life behind enemy lines. Seeing Bucky go from arrogant to afraid was a nice transition. It really made him a more sympathetic character. I would have watched an entire episode about his journey. Unfortunately, we had to spend two thirds of the episode's runtime watching Crosby and Rosenthal lounging around. Maybe if they had cut Crosby's scenes and shown more of Rosenthal's realization that he's not alone up there, but part of a crew that needs him to function at the best of his abilities, that could have made for more entertaining television. There were some shots just of him waking up to a cup of coffee or watching guys play in a boat. Crosby's scenes just served to show how scummy the British men were. I don't think he came across a single positive example on his whole trip. The series so far has really lacked the memorable scenes. I have not talked about a single scene of this entire show with anyone I know. Maybe that's because no one else I know is watching it. But usually then I will try to convince people to watch it by recounting exciting parts of the latest episode. That's just not happening with Masters of the Air. Last night I was watching some clips of Band of Brothers on YouTube, and they were all interesting, and I still remembered the characters after all these years. I could still imagine how different soldiers would have handled each situation differently. Not so with Masters of the Air. What scene would anyone clip out to highlight from this series? I bet it'll be scenes of planes flying through the flak. The volume made its presence felt again in this episode, especially in the bombed out German town. It just provides such diffuse lighting, everything looks so fake. Thankfully we're back closer to the one hour episode length, so we can actually get into some in-depth exploration of the characters and their situations. If we can just concentrate more on the actual interesting parts and less on the dull pointless bits, we can finish off the series strong. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie, thanks for your time, and have a good one.